Funding for Race of the Century is made possible in part through a grant from Ford Motor Company, celebrating 100 years with great pride and looking to the future with no boundaries. Additional funding provided by Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, dedicated to inspiring people to learn from America's traditions of ingenuity, resourcefulness, and innovation. One has to project oneself back a hundred years and say, well, what was the mood? People are excited about coming into the 20th century. It was a new era. In 1901, automobiles were new. They were noisy. They were faster than anything that most people had seen other than railroad trains. If you drove in races, you became famous. Alexander Winton was one of the most famous automobile manufacturers of the day. He was also perhaps the most famous racer in America. And Henry Ford was a 38-year-old mechanic who had already failed once in the automobile business. It was local boy Henry Ford challenging the great race car driver Alexander Winton. Today, the racing names are legend. Jarrett and the Arbro, Petty and Rudd. They hit speeds of nearly 200 miles per hour. The competition, intense. The cash payoffs, huge. One hundred years ago, there was only one important name in racing. Alexander Winton. And on October 10th, 1901, a single challenger, Henry Ford. The two men would tear down a dusty track, pushing their vehicles to the limit. Knowing the finish line was only the beginning. This was far more than a recreational afternoon. This was an event. This was, was big. In 1901, uh, auto racing was a, was a new big attraction. Automobiles were new. A lot of people hadn't seen them. And having an auto race in Detroit was a big deal. Not everybody called them automobiles or cars. They had various names for them. So these new, let's use the word contraptions, we're going to run in Gross Point. Well, everything shut down. It went in the newspapers. It was a well-publicized event. Many of the businesses in Detroit were closed for the day. Um, the joke is they let all the lawyers out <laughs> to come to the race. Four races were scheduled throughout the day, but everyone was really there to see the favored driver do what he did best, win. At this particular time in history, Alexander Winton was probably the major uh, player in automobile racing at that time. Uh, very, uh, very well known throughout the country. My great grandfather, I obviously never had a chance to meet him, but uh, it is relatively easy to know uh, because of stories. He came to the United States out of Scotland about 1880, and the first several years he was living in New York City and he was a plant superintendent, I believe, and then he became an engineer on, on freighters, uh, going down to South America and back, working on the boilers, the engines, the, the entire system, before he finally came to Cleveland, and uh, this is where the Winton Bicycle Company started. It was quite a successful bicycle. 
For years, I thought it must have been a $10 bicycle until I was given a, uh, a Winton advertising manual for the bicycles. They were selling for $125 in 1895. Winton started with bicycles here in Cleveland in 1892. He started experimenting with a gasoline motor around 1894, 1895. By 1896, he came and developed his first prototype automobile, about an eight horsepower car. Winton, 36, could dream it, could build it, could race it. And he was also the leading car maker in a field of hundreds. Alexander Winton was one of the most famous uh, automobile manufacturers of the day. He had a plant in Cleveland. He was very successful. He was building automobiles. He was a happy but feisty Scotchman, maybe about five foot eight. Had an engineering mind, one of these self-trained, self-educated engineers. Uh, always looking for things to do and wanting to work both with his mind and his hands. Of course, being an engineer, he read Scientific America. I went and had a little tiny two by two ad in there, automobile, went in automobiles available $1,000. And that's how he sold the first automobile. Uh, a fellow by the name of Robert Allison, of Port Carbon, Pennsylvania, who was an engineer, he said, I want one of these. He gets credit for the first successful commercially sold automobile, March 24th, 1898. By 1901, Winton stood atop the fledgling auto industry. His massive factory had already produced nearly 300 cars. The original building still stands today. Each and every Winton was individually crafted, making them expensive, but also desirable. Winton's company became, for a while, the most successful automobile company in the world. The age of the hand-built car, custom-made, often out of leftover farming equipment, in garages from New England to the Midwest. Every designer with his own nameplate, hoping to strike it rich. There is an interesting analogy between the automobile industry in its early days and, say, the dot-com industry. The internet is new and people are trying to figure out, how can I make a profit on this thing? Where are the opportunities? At the turn of the century, you had a major influx of inventors and different methods of carrying people in a self-propelled vehicle. Whereas in the latter part of the century, you had the same type of invention in the mindset of being able to transform information faster. So you still had like a transportation mode, but one was with four wheels and the other one was through the electronic age. guys in garages with a wrench, a welding torch, and, and some hope. And every day there was another one. There were hundreds and hundreds of names. You have to remember there was no automobile manufacturers in Detroit. Cleveland was probably one of the major hubs. Cleveland had Peerless, Winton, White, and there was a couple other ones there. And then New England, of course, with Dure and Stevens. At the turn of the century was Ransom Olds. And the Oldsmobile, the Curved Dash Olds, was uh, supposedly the first uh, series production car we had in this country. Which was going to garner a very large market, be very successful, but it was very much a horseless carriage. Also, you were getting European cars imported, especially by very wealthy people. Renaults were coming in. You had Daimlers, and you had Benzes coming in the country. And what happened at the beginning, cars were costing two and three thousand dollars, which were horrendous sums in 1901, 1902, 1903 in this country. 
Winton's concept and his philosophy, I believe, was that it really wasn't a car for the masses. At that time, it was a plaything for the rich. It was a toy. It was a novelty. Alexander Winton's status in the marketplace mirrored his dominance on the racetrack. He comfortably sat in first place. We have a lot of different concepts here with first. First with the automobile tires, 1896. First to come out with a steering wheel for the 1901 model. First to use a publicist in the sense of promoting his car run in 1899 using the word automobile, a French term, so he's accredited with that. He was first to put out a sales brochure for an automobile. First to go from Cleveland to New York. First to have the gasoline-powered mail delivery wagon. Winton was the first car with a self-starter. First to attempt to go from San Francisco to New York first track mile at a minute and 48 seconds. Winton and his contemporaries were the pioneers of their day. But like startups in any new industry, most companies would not survive. At this point, the auto industry was, was very new and it was still in a state of flux. Nobody really knew how to go about making money in this industry. You had people like Winton, who were at the upper end of the industry and selling expensive cars and, and thought that the way you do it is you sell these cars to wealthy people who can afford them. And they were tailor-made for the individual. They would come in and actually tailor-make it to their needs. Each car was separate. Someone may want a different windshield, someone may want a different length of the steering wheel or the steering column, different where's where the pedals were, the different handles. They may be tailor-made for that individual. Winton has defined the industry by 1900. But Winton still needed to jumpstart his business, to take it further down the road. Alexander Winton was one of the first people to recognize that auto racing could help sell cars. And so winning another race would just be another feather in his cap, and another proof that Winton cars were good cars. October 10th, 1901. The Detroit Driving Club sponsored an exciting day of racing. The location, a one-mile oval dirt track in Gross Point, Michigan. The big event was saved for last. The crowd lined the stands to see the great Winton. It was a good day, it was a nice day. It wasn't raining, probably a good fall day in Michigan. Not too cold, but a uh, nice time to go out and, uh, and watch these newfangled automobiles run around the track. And uh, they drew 8,000 people out to a horse track in Gross Point to see people uh, participate in a day of auto racing. And Winton, with that particular race, was going to be the headline. Two things were at stake. First of all, there was $1,000 at stake, and $1,000 in 1901 was a lot of money. The second thing was, and in, in the end it proved to be more valuable than $1,000, was the notoriety. So that race was supposedly a, to take place with 25 vehicles. By the time it was going to take place, some of those vehicles backed out at the last minute because of mechanical problems. By race time, only one other driver remained. Henry Ford was a 38-year-old um, mechanic who had already failed once in the automobile business, and he was known around Detroit, and that was about it. And everybody assumed that Alexander Winton would win this race, whether Henry Ford was in it or not. And the only person that gave Henry Ford much of a chance was Henry Ford. Most locals knew Ford as a Dearborn farmer with a knack for repairing watches and tinkering with engines. Henry Ford saw more in himself, perhaps first dreaming about his potential while attending the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. 
There, European horseless carriages captured the imagination of some and were just as easily dismissed by others. Ford was mesmerized and set to work on his own internal combustion engine. Within three years, he built his first real car, a two-cylinder vehicle, the revolutionary quadricycle. But where success greeted Winton at every turn, Ford had difficulty. His first venture, the Detroit Automobile Company, went under in January 1901. So by October, he believed a victory on the track would bring him much needed attention. That's when he entered the race at Gross Point as a dark horse. If you drove in races, you became famous. And Henry Ford was completely aware of the value of getting his name known through motorsports. The stakes were much higher for Henry Ford. He'd failed once. He was trying to get new backers for another automobile venture. He was trying to demonstrate that he was a good engineer. He wasn't making a lot of money. And as a matter of fact, he and Clara, his wife, took their son Etzel, my grandfather, and moved into Henry Ford's father's home because they literally couldn't afford to live by themselves. History says that he had a job at Edison Lighting and that he tinkered with a car in his garage. And he went to some friends and he said, let's build a race car. And I think they probably looked at him and said, you're crazy. Um, but he pursued it and built the 1901 sweepstakes car. Setting probably is not unlike uh, modern day motor racing. And I'm sure there was a lot of excitement. And you can imagine all these people packed in a horse track cheering and screaming. And, and uh, I mean, it really must have been quite something to see the start of that race. It was a David and Goliath story. It was local boy Henry Ford challenging the great race car driver Alexander Winton in a 10 lap race. I'm sure he was scared to death. Anybody would have been scared to death. Here's a young man uh, in his first opportunity, and he's off challenging, you know, then the Jackie Stewart of his time uh, in a car race that, that he hoped would generate publicity for him. The two cars were rolled into position. Winton had muscle on his side, a robust 70 horsepower worth. Alexander Winton's car was a relatively large car. Winton actually ended up building four of these. He called them his heavy racer. Visually, you look at the two cars side by side, and Ford's car is smaller. It had about half the horsepower of Winton's car. By comparison, the Ford was underpowered, only 26 horsepower. It had not a lot of horsepower, but he also used for lightweight technology because Winton's car, even though it had more horsepower and was a bigger car and heavier. Henry Ford's vision was a smaller car, more lightweight and a more efficient engine. Henry's car wasn't really competitive, but he had the guts to go out there and see what would happen. Ford probably had the power maybe to keep up with Alex when he first started out, but he did not have the driving experience. This was his first and only race he ever raced. Winton had already set a new world speed record earlier in the day and was expected to knock off his upstart opponent with ease. The crowd was amused by Ford's inexperience, underlined by the two test laps he took with a bicycle racer named Tom Cooper. Cooper was there to advise Ford 
about track conditions and how best to take the turns. No one believed Ford had a chance. Winton was ready to take home the prize money and a special cut glass punch bowl he coveted as his trophy. The trophy, uh, as the story goes, uh, was picked by Winton's people. The promoter of the race was so sure that Alexander Winton was going to win that he actually let Winton's mechanic pick the trophy. And the mechanic went out and bought a Tiffany punch bowl, cut beautiful cut glass punch bowl, glass cups, because he knew Winton liked that sort of thing. By late afternoon, the grandstand was abuzz. The outcome of this match race would reverberate well beyond the dirt track at Gross Point that day. A moment suspended in time as the starter raised his pistol in the crisp fall air. It probably was kind of a nerve-wracking moment when the gun went off and, and uh, the race started. Winton aggressively charged ahead. Ford, with his riding mechanic Spider Huff crouched precariously on the side, had trouble in the turns from the very start. Even when Huff leaned out to counterbalance, it just wasn't enough to stabilize the car. Ford had to cut the power just to stay on the track. You can imagine sitting four feet high on one of these contraptions that uh, had tires that probably had a 10% chance of going 10 miles. Wooden wheels, no roll bar, no fire retardant uh, clothing, anything. We were very lucky that Henry Ford didn't kill himself in one of those things. Although the sweepstakes in 1901 was a relatively simple race car by today's standards, it was quite common then to have a mechanic ride alongside the driver on the running board. Uh, to kind of oversee the engine operation and to assist the driver in the actual operation of the hand levers. You've got a throttle and you've got a brake, a handbrake on the side of the car. You've got Spider Huff who helped build the car with you, who's, you know, working the throttle and he's working the spark uh, detonators. And of course, he's crouching on the side to provide ballast as my great grandfather's making a series of left hand turns. And I'm sure it was just frightening. By lap three, Winton was at full stride. Ford was rapidly losing ground in the turns. The struggle to keep up quickly became a struggle to simply stay in the race. They told me the top speed was 75 miles an hour. I mean, it must have been just unbelievable. It's just hard to imagine what had to be going through his mind. Absolutely amazing the type of determination that he had and the willpower to do something like that. But Winton continued to outmaneuver and outdrive Ford. By lap five, his heavy racer dominated Ford's sweepstakes. Winton's victory was imminent. The prize money, the trophy punch bowl, and the attention of potential investors in the stands were about to be his. Probably around the fifth or sixth lap, Henry Ford was thinking to himself, there is no chance I'm gonna win this race. Then, the unexpected. Apparently, as they were coming down the front straightaway onto the seventh lap, Winton's engine starts to sputter. The crowd was on their feet, screaming. 
and I'm sure that my great-grandfather thought <laughs> victory is at hand. A newspaper reporter who witnessed the dusty duel wrote, Suddenly the Winton machine began to slow down, then a thin wreath of smoke appeared at the rear of the machine, and it gradually increased to a cloud. A cloud in which Ford could see a silver lining. Here is the best race car in the world and the best driver in the world, and his car is going, his engine's sputtering. Gases were very bad. They were very, very crude, low octane, and very, uh, the ignition systems were very primitive in comparison to what we know today, and you had to tinker with them all the time. The newspaper account continued. Ford swept by them as though they were standing still. Down the stretch, he came like a demon, and the crowd yelled itself hoarse. He literally passed Wimpton on the front straightaway. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps telling you the story. Clara Ford would later explain the excitement in a letter. I wish you could have seen him. I also heard the cheering crowd when he passed Winton. The people went wild. One man threw his hat up, and when it came down, he stomped on it. He was so excited. Another woman stood up in her seat and screamed, I'd bet $50 on a Ford if I had it. The winning time, 13 minutes, 23.8 seconds. The average speed, 44.8 miles per hour. And at the finish line, Henry Ford. Many spectators pressed forward, passing Alexander Winton as Henry Ford had just done. Among them, wealthy investors prepared to finance the winner's next venture. He proved two things. He proved that his car would last, and he also proved that in order to finish first, you must first finish. It's an old bromide today, but he did it. Now, all of a sudden, local boy makes good, and it's Henry Ford. And he now can go to backers and say to them, listen, I'm serious about my notion of building cars, and I want you to support me. The today often overused phrase about a win on Sunday, sell on Monday, uh, in those days it was win on Sunday, you get enough notoriety, you can raise money on Monday. Had Ford lost, it would have been harder for him to get another set of investors to back him in another automobile company. The race was a defining moment for what would become the Ford Motor Company. The trophy, handpicked for Alexander Winton, went to Henry Ford. Henry's wife is kind of astonished as she wrote in one of her letters, cut glass punch bowl, what am I gonna do with it? Because the Fords were pretty modest circumstances at this point, and they, they didn't really have a place to use this punch bowl. He gave it to Clara, and they took it home, and it sat at Fairlane um, literally until Clara died. In the winner's circle, a surprise announcement. After things had settled down, Apparently a reporter came to him and said, well, Mr. Ford, are you going to race again? And he said, no, I'm going to leave that to the professionals. And he said, if Winton drives my race car, we'll have a sure winner. Racing was not what he wanted to do. That was Henry Ford's last race.
The crowd witnessed one thing. The press reported another. They still considered Winton their darling, with headlines celebrating his new speed record and ignoring his loss to Ford. The news was a little slanted towards Winton, I guess you might say, in the fact that the headlines said that he had won, but he really didn't win the race. He had, he had set, the, set the record at that time. Alex was upset that the car had quit on him, but losing one race at that time, I don't believe was the end of the world for him. In the 24th at the same track, which is 14 days later, he set the record for 10 miles, and Henry Ford was one of the official timers. Ford's surprise upset of Winton attracted the financing necessary to create a new company just weeks after his victory. The Henry Ford Company was born on November 30th, 1901. Although Ford had declared an end to his racing career, he wasn't really through with racing. He understood the value of promoting the automobile through track competition. However, the investors who launched his new enterprise did not want to build his race cars. Ford had bigger plans than they were willing to support. In a letter to his brother-in-law, Ford wrote, My company will kick about me following racing, but they will get the advertising, and I expect to make dollars where I can't make sense in manufacturing. Disillusioned, Ford left the company that bore his name in March of 1902. The business survived with a new name. That company went on through various iterations and became the Cadillac division of General Motors. With barely $900 and the not yet completed plans for a new race car, Ford teamed up with Tom Cooper the man who helped him win the race in 1901. And they decided that they wanted to build a pair of racing cars. Uh, and they built these huge four-cylinder racing cars, essentially twins of one another. One car was called the 999, named after the famous New York Central locomotive which actually set the land speed record in, uh, on a railroad track at 112 and a half miles an hour in the 1890s. And the other one was called the Arrow, which also was named after a locomotive. These were the fastest things on wheels at the time. Henry and Tom Cooper built these things, wanted to race them. Once they got them built, they both realized that neither one of them wanted to have anything to do with driving these things, because they were very scary. They were mean machines, with oil spewing everywhere, on the car and driver. They were also lean machines, by every stretch of the imagination. Stripped down to the basics, no hood or bodywork exposing gears and shafts. A massive grinding flywheel at the driver's feet. Unprotected valves and electrical connections. Steering was controlled by a two-handed tiller, an iron bar pivoting in the middle. In the words of a journalist at the time, practically an engine on four wheels, a machine with brute strength and a disregard for nearly all the essentials of modern automobile construction. With neither Cooper nor Ford willing to drive the 999, Cooper found a daring volunteer. He says, I know this other bicycle racer who'll do anything. So they bought Cooper's buddy out, who'd never driven a car before. His name was Barney Oldfield. They put Oldfield in 999, and Oldfield took to it like a duck to water, so I can do that. The guy had never driven a car before, and therefore he didn't know enough to be afraid. And they entered 999 in a race at Gross Point in 1902. The fast five-mile challenge on October 25th 
little more than a year after the 1901 race. And lo and behold, who comes back to Gross Point but Alexander Winton, looking for a rematch. And Barney Oldfield is now driving 999. Once again, two cars, a Ford and a Winton. The stakes were high. Ford was again without a company. And with this new car, he put everything on the line. He could not afford to lose. Ford wins again, beats Alexander Winton, and further enhances Henry Ford's reputation. Ford's 999 set a new record for a five-mile race. Five minutes, 28 seconds. Which then makes it a little bit easier for him to get some backers uh, for what ultimately becomes the third company, the successful company, Ford Motor Company. It was official on June 16, 1903. Five weeks later, Ford's first production car rolled out of his small plant on Mack Avenue in Detroit. The two-cylinder, eight-horsepower Model A. Top speed, 30 miles per hour. Cost, $850. Ford Motor Company flourished with three new models added to the line. The Model C, the Model F, and the top of the line four-cylinder Model B at a pricey $2,000. But the B was out of reach for the average consumer, like most cars of the era. And Ford wasn't pleased. He wanted to sell affordable Fords, not the fancy models favored by his chief business partner, entrepreneur Alexander Malcolmson. Despite the friction, the demanding Malcolmson pushed Ford to get behind the wheel for one more race. But this time, he would race the clock and attempt to shatter the land speed record. Ford conceded that the publicity would be too good to pass up. So in January of 1904, he agreed to drive the powerful 999's twin, the Arrow, newly rebuilt for the occasion. The largest open expanse that he could find was in the winter, was on Lake St. Clair, which is north of Detroit. Freezes solid in the winter. So they cleared off a path out on Lake St. Clair. A trial run on the ice. The heavy flywheel tore loose. Ford narrowly escaped serious injury. A second attempt, but no timers were present to verify the speed. Three days later, it was time to go for the record. Snow pushed into piles along the three-mile ice track. Cinders spread for traction. Henry Ford in the driver's seat, Spider Huff again on the running board. How he did it, no one is quite sure. And he had a riding mechanic hanging on the side, keeping the throttle open. And uh, it, it's just incredible that he managed this. And that it wasn't a race, but it was his second and really final personal motorsports venture. It had to be one of the bravest things of all time. He bounced this thing across the ice of Lake St. Clair. At least two times, Ford and Huff careened off the snowbanks. The finish line loomed ahead and posed its own problem, how to stop. The rear axle brake could hardly slow them down, and so the world's fastest car, clocking an average of 91.37 miles per hour, spun into a snowbank. That speed doesn't sound like much today, but if you read Henry Ford's description of going 90 plus miles an hour on Lake St. Clair, and you read Craig Breedlove's description of going 400 miles an hour at Bonneville, they're the same. They were absolutely at the edge of control, the edge of their technology, and it took an enormous amount of courage on both parts, 90 miles an hour, 400 miles an hour. It's it's remarkable just how similar that was because they're both out there right on the edge. Henry Ford's new speed record accomplished his goal. The public was now aware of his name and his cars. He could concentrate on producing those cars for eager consumers, newly intrigued by the idea of getting around on wheels. 
He needed a car for every man, uppercase E. And they built the Model T. And the Model T, which came out in 1908, not only transformed the Ford Motor Company, it transformed the United States. It was kind of a lower medium priced car at $850. It wasn't the cheapest. But then Henry fixed the design and then he worked on the production system and drove the price of the car down relentlessly. 800, 700, 500, 400. By the time it went out of production, you could get a Model T for about $290. And that was the key to making the Model T just this enormous success, the most successful car that the world had ever seen. A car for the masses needed to be mass produced. By 1913, Ford's assembly line was up and running. His innovations put him ahead of the competition, including Oldsmobile, Cadillac, Rambler, and Buick. It also put him in the classroom, where generations of students have learned about his contributions to modern manufacturing. His concern for every detail went well beyond production. And he knew the janitors by name, and they all knew him to talk to, and he was very human with everybody that worked there. And as I say, knew them all by name, and took an interest in what they were doing and their families. And I remember that very vividly about him. Then, in 1914, he shocked the industry and his own workforce. He doubled their wages. This was twice the prevailing wage for unskilled labor. Suddenly, he went from begging people to come to literally having to turn people away. The fact that he was able to raise wages to $5 a day, that was unheard of. He was uh, the first person, at least in the auto industry, to pay what we would consider a living wage. The upside was that these people who were building these cars now had more money than they ever thought they could have. They could now buy cars. Whether it was by design or by accident, he helped to create not only a mass market for cars, but he helped to create what we think of today as the modern American middle class. I guess I go back to what my grandfather had in mind. Well manufactured and engineered and sold at a reasonable price. I mean, that sounds oversimplifying it, that's the business. Business was booming, and Ford no longer believed racing was crucial to his success. The Model T was a going concern. They were building them as quickly as they could. He was the dominant player in the industry by this time. He no longer saw the necessity for competing. But his decision to leave the track behind didn't mean that his cars would remain idle. Once the Ford factory actually got out of racing, lots of other people got into building aftermarket parts for Ford cars manifolds and heads and bottom ends and transmissions and all sorts of things. And two of the people, oddly enough, who were most successful in doing that were the Chevrolet brothers. Chevrolet brothers, who built the front and back cylinder head for the Model T, got their start with Model Ts. So even though on one side Henry was out of it, its products were very visible. Ford watched his cars roll by on the assembly line, on the growing American roadways, on dirt, brick, and cement racetracks. 80,000 fans are here to see the first big stock car race of 1934. And they're off, 27 stock cars in a 250 mile drive. Standard passenger cars, minus fenders, windshields, and headlamps. Speed increased and daredevil drivers found the road to success exciting at every turn. And here's Herb Bomber in 22, a Chevrolet. There goes Bob Hahn in a Rockley. Look at number 10, Fred Frame's famous Ford, winner of the Elgin Road Race last fall. 
Rex Mays is after him in 21. Rex Mays is going to take him, and he does take him. There's Tony Galati and his white Chrysler. Now it's the checkered flag to finish. And the winner is Stubblefield. Old names and new. Veteran drivers and young racers. And everyone a hero. There's the flag. Away they go. The same Barney Oldfield as when he first drove a racing car for Henry Ford. Back in the days of old, 999. Race cars like the 999 may look primitive by today's standards, but looks can be deceiving. In order to build a working replica of Henry Ford's sweepstakes racer for public exhibition, engineers had to unlearn modern ways and trace automotive technology back to its roots through a meticulous examination of the original car. Well, there are no drawings of this vehicle. There are no specifications. There are very, very few pictures. So the only way possible to accomplish this task was to use the original vehicle, disassemble it for patterns to reconstruct the new vehicles or the replicars. The biggest challenge in replicating the sweepstakes car was trying to understand the theory of the technology of that day without confusing today's technology. There's a completely different mindset in how you would have done things a hundred years ago with what they had available to them as far as machine tools and measuring devices and, and actually raw materials. It took six months to build the replica car, about the same amount of time Ford spent constructing the original sweepstakes. When we took it out for the first time, we got it to fire up, we made all the adjustments while we're still moving down the road. The oilers and the, the fuel system, it was like a bite out of history. It took us back to like when Spider and Henry were first on it. You know, you felt the wind and it was just really exciting getting the thing running. When we first got the, uh, the sweepstakes running this morning, it was uh, obviously nobody had ever driven one of these cars since probably 1902. So we didn't know what to expect or what the car would do, how it would act, what kind of power it would make for accelerating through the grass. Quite an adventure at the time. Quite an adventure today. I rode in the car and so did Dale Jarrett. Watching that car today start, to think that it's, you know, the, the motor combination, the braking, the it was a total reproduction, a great job. But even to see it start today, you can imagine the feeling when they started that in 01. That was unbelievable. How did it happen? Pretty smart minds making that happen. I'm not sure that I'd have made it. Uh, I looked at what all it took to, to make it run and operate. Don't know that I could have been the driver, and I sure didn't want to be the, the passenger over there hanging off the side. So uh, you know, it's amazing what they went through. And, and to get uh, you know 70 miles an hour out of that vehicle in 1901 was uh, quite special. From its modest beginnings in the days of the horse and buggy, Auto racing has grown into the number one spectator sport in the world. But something equally significant happened along the way. Drivers were competing in cars that came directly from automakers' everyday stock, the origin of stock cars, and racing them has benefited the consumer profoundly. Practically all innovations have come out of racing, the independent the rear suspensions. The rear view mirror uh, came from uh, Indianapolis in 1911. The four valve cylinder heads were a direct descendant of racing. The inspired efforts of pioneers like Winton and Ford would be felt for decades to come. Advancements in braking, fuel systems, transmissions, and aerodynamics, along with common safety features, were all bred on the racetrack and continued to evolve. If they would withstand that kind of racing and punishment, then they were okay for the road. And I think that's when automobile manufacturers began to learn that racing 
could help them to build better and safer cars for the public. And how would history have unfolded if Henry Ford had not raced Alexander Winton a century ago? It's interesting to speculate what would have happened had Henry Ford lost the race. Had Ford lost, it would have been harder for him to get another set of investors to back him in another automobile company. I think if he hadn't won, he'd have tried again. So. Uh... It would have happened one way or the other, I, I'm pretty sure. I think Henry had enough tenacious that he would have found the fun some way anyways. It might have slowed him down a little bit. Uh, he might, but I think he still would have built the Model T. Without him, the motor industry in the United States of America to begin with might never have begun in the way that his foundations created it. And from then, of course, it's been a major part of America and its economy ever since. I do believe, as a member of the family, that if Henry Ford had not won that race, maybe Ford Motor Company wouldn't exist today. So that's the very serious side of this whole story. And what of Alexander Winton and his heritage? My great-grandfather started another company called the Winton engine company where he started building gasoline and diesel engines for marine and industry purposes and that became his real love. I went an automobile company, uh, produced cars through 1923 or 24 and basically just closed down but the Winton engine company continued on into about 1930 when he sold the operation to some investors and then it became part of General Motors. An ironic turn of events for a man who defined the auto industry in the early 20th century. Ford overtook Winton twice, once in business and once on a dusty track in Gross Point, Michigan. But one mystery remains. Whatever happened to Ford's prize punch bowl? A trophy which represents a crowning achievement in racing history. This punch bowl stayed in the family for years. Henry dies in 1947. A few years later, Clara dies. And so nobody realized how significant this punch bowl was. And it got sold at auction. Clara had instructed that almost all of the things at Fairlane were to be sold at auction in New York by a firm called Park Bernay. A forgotten punch bowl sold on October 17, 1951, half a century after Ford's unlikely victory. The auction program made no mention of the punch bowl's legacy. And it was only much later that they realized that this was the punch bowl that was the trophy for the 1901 race. When the gavel came down, the final bid was $70. The punch bowl's owner is unknown. It's probably sitting in somebody's dining room, I hope, with fruit in it, and they don't have a clue as to how important it was. This may have been the most important moment in Henry Ford's life. He had a lot of important moments. He had a lot of important days, but, but October 10th, 1901 was his launch day. It was his personal launch day. And not to have the trophy that he won it's a, you know, punch bowl, but, but for me personally, as a member of the family, it's, it's that closure that I'd like to have. Before the automobile, personal transportation in America was limited. People grew up and lived where they were born. Early cars were a novelty, a rich man's toy. The advent of an automobile that the working class could afford changed all that forever. Roads were laid, which allowed the average citizen a new freedom, mobility. The car culture was born, and there was no turning back. Through ingenuity and persistence, 
Henry Ford brought people closer together with the automobile. His improbable victory paved the way, putting America on wheels. And it happened in the passing lane on October 10th, 1901, in what proved to be the race of the century. Funding for Race of the Century is made possible in part through a grant from Ford Motor Company, celebrating 100 years with great pride and looking to the future with no boundaries. Additional funding provided by Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, dedicated to inspiring people to learn from America's traditions of ingenuity, resourcefulness, and innovation.